Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Duncan Road Church. I think everyone in the building knows who I am. I'm David McCann, but for those that are watching online, maybe you don't know that, but you do now. So there you go. It's good to have everyone here with us this morning uh, as we uh, have our service today. We're going to be studying the uh, book of Joshua. We're going to carry on our series in Joshua with Joshua chapter 14 later on. Um, not many other things happening this week in the building because of the holiday time. Um, but next Sunday we'll be continuing with Joshua and I believe it's going to be Kevin Walls coming to uh, lead the service for us next week. And as usual, the list is on the board if you want to do your homework beforehand. But for now, shall we stand and sing our first hymn today? Which is going to be, Oh my soul, arise and bless your maker. your maker for he is your master and your friend slow to her off the rich in tender mercy worship the Savior Jesus King of grace his love is overwhelming bread of life he's all for his blood has purchased me forever Bought at the cross of Jesus And I will sing for all my days of heaven's love come down Each breath I take will speak his praise until he calls me home When I wake I know that he is with me when I'm weak. I know that he is strong. Though I fall, his arm is there to lean on. Safe from the rock of Jesus. Stir in me the songs that you are singing. Fill my gaze with as yet unseen give me faith to move in works of power making me more like Jesus and I will sing for all my days of heaven's love come down each breath I take will speak his praise until he calls me home then one day I'll see him as he sees me face to face, the lover and the love. No more words, the longing will be over there with my precious Jesus. Do take a seat. Thank you. And then shall we pray together? Father God, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of being today able to worship you together. While our bodies may be slow to rise today, May you help our souls to be quick to rise and to bless you, our maker. Not only are you the creator of this world, but you're willing to be our friend as well as our master. You are indeed slow to anger and rich in tender mercy. And we cast ourselves upon you, seeking your amazing grace today and for forgiveness for the sins of the past week. We thank you for providing us with a saviour, the Lord Jesus. He is our bread of life, all we'll ever need. 
So please help us to get a fresh glimpse of Jesus today as we look at your word later on. Whether we feel weak or strong today, may you be glorified through our prayers, our songs, through our unity, by our praise today. Amen. Hey, Abby, if you want to come back up again before they catch their breath back. Right, we're going to sing another couple of songs. And one of the things I think is important when we're in church is not just to sing songs which are happy clappy or or whatever, but it's to sing a variety of songs which reflect all the different stages of life and all the different emotions that we go through. And so the next couple perhaps help us into a different set of you know, a, a singing of, of a different set of emotions that we might face. So, should we stand and sing these? We have sung them before. We might be a little bit rusty on them. We'll hopefully we'll catch them up as we, we go along. So, let's stand to sing Waymaker uh, to begin with. You are here. I worship you, I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. And again, you are here. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here healing every heart. I worship you. You are here turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Because you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep a light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. No way maker, miracle worker, promise keep a light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 
That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Now remain standing to sing when the tears fall. Lord God, we live in a troubled world. It's a world where violence and pain and death are all too common. And even in our own country this week, there has been such tragic news. Lives so unexpectedly taken, unrest, guilty verdicts in court. Lord, please... 
Would you comfort those who mourn? Whether in our own church, those who are mourning here, or wider afield. Would you help those who are seeking to bring justice? Would you have mercy on our land? Lord, please would you help our government and our other authorities like the police force as they try to to restore and sustain order and bring prosperity to people? Please would you give them wisdom in each decision that they have to make. For every person that faces the public eye, please would you help them to have integrity. Help them to know Jesus. And the cleansing and healing and life-giving power of the Holy Spirit as they put their trust in him. Father, as I look at the news, I cannot understand how people can do such terrible things. How they can hate others so much or be so vile in their actions. But then, Lord, when I look at myself, I cannot understand how I can be so blessed and yet be so greedy, so grumpy, so lazy at times. How my own thoughts can be so vile in themselves. Lord, I'm sorry. Please would you forgive me. Please would you forgive all of those here today who are also sorry for those things that they have done wrong this week. Please would you restore us and help us to live lives that are more pleasing to you over the coming week. Lord, for those who have worse physical conditions than us right now, or for those here that are struggling this morning, Ask for your blessing on them too. If you are willing, please would you bring some physical improvement. But if not in the midst of it, I pray you'd help those people to endure. And give them an outward focus too. That they will be able to bless others even as they are struggling. For those who are elderly, please would you help them to be patiently enduring their limitations this week. Help them to remain or be an example to others this week of what it looks like to be followers of Jesus right up to the end. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. You know what's best for us and best for your world and what would most glorify you. So in the way that only you know best, please would you answer our prayers. Amen. Okay. So as I said earlier, we are going through the book of Joshua. Last week we had, uh, uh, mine goes blank, who was last week? That's the one, Ed Powell last week, Penny wasn't even here and she knows, so there we go. So Ed Powell last week on, on, uh, on Joshua 13, and we're looking at a little bit of 14, and we're carrying on in chapter 14 today. So it'll be on the screen, but if you want to follow it in your Bible, it's Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. Now, I forgot to ask the children and the adults to look out for some things while we're in this passage this morning. Okay, so here's what you need to look out for. We've just heard about this man, Caleb. And he's the one we're looking at today, Caleb. So I want you to listen out for how old Caleb is. It tells you in the passage in a bit, so how old he is. And there's also a way that he's described, beginning with W. And it appears three times in the passage today. So I want you to look out for that word that describes Caleb, beginning with W. So look out for his age, and look out for that W word, okay? Right, here we go. So verse 7. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions, but 
my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the heart of the people sink. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out, and I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then... Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. And then the land had rest from war. Okay. How old was Caleb? 85 years old. Older than me then. It might not look like it. Can you believe it? He was older than me. And what was that W word? Wholeheartedly. He was wholeheartedly seeking the Lord. Right. I asked my children or some of my children today what songs you do upstairs sometimes and which ones they like to sing. And one of my children chose this one here that you're going to have. So rather than having me embarrass you today with Jesus is the mighty, mighty king, you can actually follow along with this little light of mine. So feel free to stand up if you want to, because you might need to walk and sing, but it's up to you. Okay, do you want to take it away, Josh? Thank you. This is the light of mine.
Awesome, thank you. Right. You can even get the DVD from listenerkids.com, apparently. Right. Now, <clears throat> put up your hands, please, if you've watched or listened or kind of seen anything of the Olympics that have been going on this week. Quite a few of you. Okay. And so you'll all be familiar with some of the, you know, the, the big names. Who have we had this week? Uh, we had Bryony Page winning the trampoline. Uh, who else did we have? Uh, uh, the, 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 eight, the eight rowers yesterday, I think they won gold or something like that. Anyway, we have all these sort of people that we have from the great British team. But Joshua is now going to come and uh, uh, test you on perhaps some of the less familiar people of the Olympics or of sporting history. So come on up, Joshua. Thank you. Good morning. So Good these, morning. Are, these are the questions I thought of to test you on some of the older people. So question one. I'll give you some pictures, but not yet, because they will give the answer away. So at the 1912 Summer Olympics, the Swedish athlete Oscar Svahn became the oldest athlete ever to win Olympic gold at the age of 64. In what sport did he win this medal? So children and adults, if you wish, Please, could you point to that wall if you think he won the medal in the sculpting event? Yes, artistic events used to be part of the Olympics, and sculpting was one of them. Sculpting. Could you please point to that wall if you think he won his medal in the single-shot running deer shooting event? <laughs> and could you point to the ceiling if you think he won it in the tug-of-war, which also used to be an Olympic sport? So that side for the sculpting, that side for the single-shot running deer shooting, and that one for the tug-of-war. It was actually that one, the single shot running deer shooting event. There he is. Question two then. I'll give you the photo this time. In 2014, Australian Dorothy DeLoe died, still as an active table tennis player. How old was she? Could you point to that wall if you think she was 97 when she died? Could you point to that wall if you think she was 100? And could you point to the ceiling if you think she was 103 when she was still playing the table tennis? <laughs> the correct answer was she was 103. So anyone pointing at the ceiling, well done. <laughs> right, qu number three. Tsutomu Oshima is the world's oldest karate player who will be celebrating his 94th birthday on Tuesday. He started learning karate at 18 in 1948. How many years did it take for him to earn his black belt to the highest possible level? Was it four years? He earned it in 1952, point to that side. Was it 14 years? He earned it in 1962, point to that side. Or if you think it was 40 years in 1988 when he earned it, point to the ceiling. So four years, 14 years, or 40 years. The correct answer was that side. He had, took four years to earn his black belt. Okay, number four. Charles Eugster was known as the world's oldest bodybuilder until his death in 2017 at the age of 97. Although he competed for the United Kingdom, what was his actual nationality? Point to that side if you think he was French, that side if you think he was German, or the ceiling if you think he was Swiss. His name was Charles Eugster. Correct answer, he was Swiss. So anyone pointing at the ceiling, well done. Right, 86-year-old gymnast Johanna Kwas, or Kwas was filmed on YouTube working out in 2012, earning herself the Guinness World Record of oldest female gymnast. What was she performing on? Point to that side if you think it was the vault. That side if you think it was the uneven bars. And the ceiling if you think it was the parallel bars. So vault, uneven bars, parallel bars. Correct answer was the parallel bars, the ceiling. There she is. Right. 
the 69-year-old grandfather of six from the Bahamas, known as the grandfather of racing, is the oldest jockey still competing. What is his name? If you think his name is Gus Black, point to that wall. If you think his name is Gary Bain, point to that wall. And if you think his name is Geraint Bartlett Campbell, point at the ceiling. So, Gus Black, Gary Bain, or Geraint Bartlett Campbell? Correct answer is Gary Bain, that wall over there. At four feet and 11 inches, Barbara, Barbara Buttrick is known as the mighty atom of the ring. At 92, this British woman is the oldest living boxer in the world. How many fights has she won in her career? If you think she's won over 35 fights, point to that wall. If you think she's won over 55, point to that wall. And if you think she's won over 75, point at the ceiling. So 35, 55, 75. I've got to remember which one's which now. The correct answer is 35, so that wall there. And Polish athlete Stanisław Kowalski has the distinction of being the world's oldest ever professional athlete. In 2015, he managed to run 100 meters in 34.50 seconds, cast a shot put 4.27 meters, and throw a discus 7.50 meters. But how old was he when he managed these feats? If you think he was 104, point to that wall. If you think he was 107, point to that wall. And if you think he was 111, point to the ceiling. The correct answer is the ceiling. He was 111 when he managed these. And, and for your bonus question, how much older was this sole entrant of the males over 105 division? He was so old he had to have a new category introduced just for him. How old was he much older than the competitor nearest his age? If you think he was seven years older than his nearest competitor, point to that wall. If you think he was 17 years older than the nearest person to his age, that one, and if you think he was 27 years older, point at the ceiling. The correct answer is that wall. He was seven years older. John Whitmore was 104, and he also took part. So there's, there's some facts for you. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. So your next question is now to put up your hand for those who are over 100, whether you're inspired now to enter the 100-meter sprint at the next... Uh, opportunity. There you go. You see, even when you are older, you are still capable of great things. Maybe you're not necessarily going to be great at doing the shot put or the discus, but you can still do great things. And in our passage today, we had Caleb, who was how old? 85. He was 85 years old. But the thing which was most impressive about him to the person who wrote the Bible, or even to God, was not that he followed God when he was young. Not that he followed God when he was in the middle of his life, but that he followed, his, followed God wholeheartedly all through his life, from the start to the finish. And what I would encourage all of us here, whether you're young and starting out on your journey of faith, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're old-aged, it doesn't matter how old you are. God still wants us all to be wholeheartedly following him, just like Caleb in our Bible reading today. Now, we've actually got two parts to our Bible reading today. We have a slight bit more on Caleb in the next chapter, so we're going to skip on a few verses that Kevin will come back to you next week, and uh, look at uh, a few verses from Joshua 15. So in accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judea. Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the sons of Anak. Remember, as we were told by Ed last week, if you don't know how to pronounce them, doesn't matter. Just sound confident. Did I sound good? I have no idea how that sound meant to be. From there, he marched against the people living in Debir, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures 
Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, took it. So Caleb gave him his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, what can I do for you? She replied, do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. So there you go. Right, we're going to sing one more song, and then the children are going to go up to explore us. So as we're going through a range of emotions, let's sing more of an uplifting hymn of praise to God. Shall we stand? Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to His feet Thy tribute bring, ransom He'll restore. Praise Him for His grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise Him still the same forever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, glorious in Him. Father, like he tends and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hand he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him. Angels help us to adore him, ye behold him face to face, sun and moon bow down before him, dwellers all in time and space, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise, him, praise with us. Sit down then and feel free, and then explore as you can head upstairs to your group, and we'll see you later. <laughs> and we'll just pray for them as they head up, and for ourselves as well. Father, please, would you help those young people to grasp what it means to wholeheartedly follow you. Help their leaders there as they try and teach that. Give them the right words to say. Pray you'd help me as I try and bring this passage before the congregation as well. May we all have open ears to hear what you would have to say to us this morning. Amen. Okay. So, here we are in Joshua. Chapter 14. Wholehearted following was the title I was given. I don't know if you remember when I was here a few weeks ago, I was preaching on Romans chapter 11, and I gave a little thought experiment out to you, where I told you uh, to think about what it might be like if uh, all the uh, sort of older members of the congregation suddenly weren't allowed to come to church anymore. Uh, people are looking blankly, but there we go. 
But that's what I talked about at that point, because that's what a bit like it was like for the Roman church, when effectively all the Jews had been told to leave, and they'd had to sort of, the Gentiles had to set up church effectively by themselves before they came back again. So now I want you to engage your brains and have another little thought experiment to help you think through what it would be like in our Bible passage today. So I want you to think about, and so as you look around, and there's perhaps fewer people today than there might have been, imagine all the people, not just in this church, but in the whole area, any man 20 years older than yourself no longer existed. So already a number of people in this room would be gone. We wouldn't see them again. And in fact, in the whole community, there would suddenly be this generational gap of the missing men, possibly even the women, if you get my analogy that I'm kind of coming to, but certainly the men would all be gone in this as we sort of think this through, because this is kind of what the Israelites were facing here. So we kind of get the story so far from Caleb as he sort of tells it, that in the book, books sort of prior, in Numbers, the people had been taken out of Egypt by God in a miraculous way, and they were given this land by God to take control of. That was their inheritance, as we sort of heard about last week. And so they came to the edge of it, and Moses, who was the leader then, chose 12 men. We're told he chose 12 chiefs from among the men. These were already notable men as it was. He chose 12 men, one from each tribe, and we're told the names of who they were and their fathers and, and so on. And he sent them out to spy out the land. So off they skulked around, checking out what it was like, so they could bring back a report to the people. And they came back, and the majority report, in fact, everybody said, it looks great. This is a fantastic land, and they brought back the grapes, and they had to carry it on poles. The weight of the grapes was so big. They had these great tales to tell. But the majority of the report also said, that, yeah, it's great, but the people, oh, they're big. The cities, they are strong. We can't do this. They came up with the but word, but this, but that. And only two of those spies came back with a positive report. They didn't deny it. They said, yeah, the people are tall, the cities are strong, but the Lord is with us. And so don't fear. With his help, we can go and we can take that land. However, they were not listened to. They listened to the report of the ten, and indeed, God pronounces his judgment on that lot and says, fine. If you're not going to believe me, if you're not going to trust that with me with you, you can take this land, fine. Wander around in the desert then. And you can all die off and I'll raise up a generation of other people who will go in and take that land. And so they did. They spent 40 years wandering around in the desert, pretty much for the purpose of watching the old people die. Until only two are left. Those two spies that gave the good report, one of them is now the leader. He's Joshua. He's what the book's named after. But the other one perhaps is a bit more in the background. But suddenly he appears back again 45 years later, we're told. Caleb. He's back. And he's got things that he wants to say. And I believe things that he can teach us from his life as we look at what does it mean for someone to follow God even into their old age. And so Caleb told us how God has said, you're going to inherit some of this land. And so Caleb comes with a bold request. And it's perhaps slightly implicit in the text rather than being told exactly. But he kind of comes along, I think, and says, you see that mountain, that hill, whatever you want to call it. You see that? You see that? That's what I want. Give me that land. Give me that hill. I want that one. And it's quite a bold request. You see, Joshua is about to divvy up the land himself. 
Each tribe is about to get their portion. And yet this one man, he comes and said, I want that one. Give me that one. And so we're going to look at, why does Caleb have the right to choose? What is it about him that allows him to come that boldly? What is it about his character that led him to that point in verses 10 to 12? And just to sort of summarize the passage, so that if I do run out of time, at least you've had all of the verses, as we come to the last sort of three of section, Joshua says, yep, you can have that. And the inheritance is given to Caleb and to his sons and to his sons and to his sons and to his sons. And, and so on. To his family, get this land. And then the land has rest for a little while. So what land was he actually being given? So this is Hebron. The picture on the screen there is kind of modern day Hebron. It is um, over 900 meters above sea level. It's this kind of mountainous region. And uh, the sort of the the, the, the the, the formation of the, the ground there makes it very fertile for growing. It's a great growing area. And so it's great for fruit, even now, great for fruit, great for vines. Um, and so it's, it's a very attractive area. And it's a very historic area. So in Genesis, if you go back to Genesis, it was on the kind of the, the sort of foothills on the edge of Hebron where Abraham was buried. And so. This makes Hebron still one of the very big places um, of religion in that area. So for, for Muslims as well, for example, because it's got that patriarchal heritage, it's very important to them too, this area of Hebron. But this passage here isn't just about Caleb, because this whole book that we're coming to is a whole book of trying to teach the Israelites ongoingly throughout their history of will you trust God to do what he promised? Will you trust God to help you through the difficult times? And if we were to skip on a few chapters to chapter 17, as the land is being allotted out, you have some of the other groups come back. And in contrast to Caleb that says, with God helping me, I'll drive them out. They kind of come wheedling up to Joshua and go, why have you only given us this much? And there's this kind of undercurrent of, the thing you've given me, you know, they've all got chariots of iron. We don't want that land. Could you give us something else? And so this is kind of this sandwich of Caleb here has that, that go-to mentality of, I'm going to take this mentality versus this contrast later on of the other tribes who are kind of, it's still that, but, but we can't do this mentality. And so Caleb is being set up as this example for us, trusting God and keeping going, even to the end. So that's the kind of summary of this passage that you've already got there. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more, kind of go into a little bit more about this man, Caleb. Now, Forget your ABCs. Today you're really lucky because I went for the ABCDEs. Okay, so you've got five things to remember today about Caleb, the man Caleb. So the first one I want to go into is kind of perhaps the theme that we've got here today of being all in, wholehearted. It is not just Caleb himself describing this characteristic. It's not Joshua saying this. It's not just the, sort of the, 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 the writer of the book here saying this. This was how God described Caleb. Wouldn't you love God to describe you this way? You're a wholehearted follower. That's what God's pronouncement about Caleb was. What do you think it means? The thing is, I don't think I can tell for you what wholehearted following God would look like for you. Because you're not me, you're not my wife, you're not my children. I could perhaps go into them as, with our personalities and our backgrounds of what it might look like for us. But for you, you're going to have to decide that yourself. Although there are perhaps some principles to think about. 
Now, at the moment, I'm really enjoying listening to the Olympics. We don't have a television, so I'm listening to it on the radio while I'm working. So occasionally, my family might get a sort of a, a sigh or a cheer from me, and they're kind of wondering what on earth I'm doing, and it's me listening into the Olympics. And it was quite interesting when there was a, I, can't, I don't know their names, but there were a couple of rowers, uh, female rowers, that won their gold in their event, double skulls or something like that. And they had an interview afterwards. And the sort of interviewer was saying, was it worth it? Was all the hard work worth it to win the gold? And they said, as they look back over the last three years since the last Olympics, all the things they've had to do, the getting up early, dragging themselves out of bed in the dark and the cold to go and train, going to bed early when they'd rather be out with their mates, missing out on going to parties, missing out on going to weddings that they had to decline, doing the hard training, every single thing in their diet being watched, the hard training sessions where it just feels that they can't do any more, but they just have this thing in mind. Their lives were centered around, we are going to win gold and have that medal around our necks. I think for me that begins to describe wholehearted. They were concentrating on that one thing. That's what meant everything to them. And so that meant other things had to be pushed to one side. Not that those other things were unimportant. I'm sure they cared greatly about those people getting married, their friends or whatever. It wasn't that it was unimportant, but it was less important. And they had to focus on what was truly important. Those Olympians, they had to do things in completeness. They couldn't say, well, I'll do the getting up early and the going to bed early bit. But I think I'd rather skip the diet stuff and the hard training. Wholehearted meant you do the whole package. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. And they had to do that consistently. They couldn't say, for a couple of weeks, we're going to work really hard, and then we'll have a three years off. It was they keep going and they would ramp it up and they would ramp it up because they knew where the finish line was. And that wasn't two years ago, that was this week. And they had to keep it going. When we become Christians, we know where the finish line is. The finish line is not when we are 40 or 50 or 60. We don't know what age it will be. But we do know where the end is. The end of our lives is the finish line, whenever that happens to be. And God is calling us to be wholehearted until that point. Concentrated, complete, consistent. That's what our lives should look like. Would people describe you like that in your Christian faith? Would they say that was something that you focused on or is it a part-time hobby? Would they say that you are someone who is obedient to God in all matters, not just a compartmentalized area of your life? Would you say that you are consistent? Do you consistently read your Bibles? Do you consistently pray? Are you consistently participating in church life together? Does your life look all in? For Caleb, I think he was an all in kind of guy. He put his eggs in that one basket. It was God's way or bust. And I think it needed to be when we come on to our next point. You see, I've skipped B for now, just to keep you on your toes. So you're going to have to learn A, C, E, D, B. Okay? Don't try and get inside my mind. You won't understand. Right. But the thing is, to be wholehearted for God... Rather than being wholehearted as an Olympian, being wholehearted for God is going to take courage. It is not going to be easy. In fact, that's the whole focus of the book. If you go back to chapter 1, God says to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. This whole book is about having that courage through difficult times. 
And right back in chapter 1, we were told the reason for having courage is not because Joshua was really strong, not because he was great at running the 100-meter sprint or throwing the shot put, but because God was with him, and that's what made the difference. That's why we today can have courage, because God is with us. But we see we need to have that, that willingness to be different. In, jo- in, so in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24, where God is describing Caleb and his attitude towards Caleb, he describes Caleb as having a different spirit. He's described as different. And he needed to to have that courage being different, giving that different report, having that different spirit. We are told that when Joshua and Caleb gave that report, the crowd were not cheering. They were picking up rocks ready to stone Joshua and Caleb. To stick their necks out to speak God's way, they were close to death. That's the courage that Caleb showed when he was a younger man in his 40s. And even now, as he gets into 85, he's still saying, you know, give me this this land, I'll go and fight for it. I'm still strong, I'm going to go and fight for it. He's still got that courage. And we need to have courage too. The person I thought of when thinking of an older person with courage is something that Liz and I came across, that's my wife, years ago. There's a video, I don't know if it's still out in there, one of Gordon's on the shelf, about um, (coughs) a lady called Marge Saint, uh, who came later in life, Marge Saint van der Puy. Um, she uh, got married to uh, a man called Nate Saint, and he was one of the five, I think it's the five missionaries, or four, uh, who went out to Ecuador, uh, and they were missionaries to a tribe there that had never had any positive contact with outsiders from their tribe. But they wanted to tell them about Jesus, and they ended up dying for their faith. And there's a little interview with her at the end of this DVD talking about that. And she was talking about how when she became a Christian, and when she was a, a student At university days, she said to God, I want your will for my life, Lord, at any cost. That's quite a bold thing to say. And then she went through those experiences and she lost her husband. And then she comes to the end of her life when she's giving this interview. And with tears in her eyes, she said... You know, I didn't think I'd get to this stage of my life, having lost a second husband prematurely, in her opinion, having gone through cancer four times. And she said she didn't think this was a cost she'd have to pay. But she said, I'm paying the cost, and I'm paying it willingly. We've never forgotten that video, and it comes back to us occasionally to kind of, when we're going through uh, difficult things as a family, we often say to ourselves, are we still willing to pay the cost that we said that we were willing to pay when we became Christians? It takes endurance in the Christian faith. At 85, Caleb refused to give up. I almost call this E energy, because he seems to have it even at that point. But I actually called it endurance. He describes himself as still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. That's impressive. And I think what we know from the passage here is that he has partnered with God. He acknowledges he is only alive because of God. Apart from one, every one of his compatriots is dead by 20 years. Or more, whatever, you know. But he's, he's one of the only ones. But he, I don't think that God just gave him strength. I think that he partnered with God and that he get, kept up his strength. He was willing to work hard still. He kept himself fit. He looked after himself. 
And as we get older, I think that's something that we have to do too. Would you say you're looking after yourself? You know, we all have limitations. We're not all Olympic athletes. Again, there was an interview, well, not an interview, there was one of the, the commentators of the Olympics this week was the, uh, the ex-javelin thrower, Steve Backley. And he was talking about his time at the Olympics, and he said, everyone, every one of us Olympic people in the javelin, everyone had an injury. Everyone had niggles. The question was not who wasn't injured, it was who had the least worst injury and could kind of carry on. We all have limitations. I've had them this week. I went for a stupidly long run and came back and, you know, Monday I could barely walk down the stairs. My hip was hurting so much. You know, I bounced back fairly quickly. But there'll be other people here who don't bounce back so quickly and who every day, for them, every day is a struggle. And we have to accept our limitations. And the good thing is, for us, is that God only expects us to use what we have. He doesn't expect us to use what we don't have. That's where God comes in as we partner with God. We can say to God, I don't feel I've got it takes today. Would you, would you help me? I'll do what I can. You do what only you can do. But Caleb kept going all the way to the end, and we need to as well. I think Caleb had drive. Not that he had a car. But he had that, that purpose about him, something that kept him going. And I think we all need that. If we don't ex try and achieve anything, if we don't aim for something, we won't achieve it. We aim at nothing, we get nothing. But we need a purpose. And I think as we grow older, that's even more key, that we have a purpose, that we don't drift through life. I haven't hit retirement yet. That's still quite a while off. But when it comes... I may have more time free. It's a great resource. But God wants us to use our time wisely, no matter what stage in life. We still need to be purposeful. Again, I was reminded of another lady. This is someone that I knew. I was at the Princess Anne Hospital in Southampton months ago. And I was just walking out the building, and, and a picture caught my eye on the wall. I thought, who's that? And for a minute there, I thought it was... I don't know quite what her right title was. Maybe Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, for those that are that age. Does that ring any bells? I kind of looked just, just out of the corner of my eye. I thought, is that her? And it's like, no. Who's that? I recognize that. And it turned out to be my old next door neighbor, or at least two doors down from my old house. In her 80s, she used to travel up to the hospital. I think she might have used to work there. She retired, but she still went back up as a volunteer and manned the desk in the hospital. And there's now a picture on the wall dedicated to all that she had done in that hospital over the years. That's the impact she made in that hospital. And I thought that was incredible. And I knew her. I didn't perhaps know half of what she was like. And as I sort of think of her, I think of Caleb, and I think of him as a spy, and I can just imagine him as he's skulking around. Can you imagine him looking at Hebron and thinking to himself, that's the one I want. That's the one. And maybe as he's wandering around that desert waiting for everyone to die for 40 years, he's just got in the back of his mind, that's the one. And he got his dream. What's your dream? You may be in your teens. You may be in your hundreds. What's your dream still for God? Whose life are you impacting? Will you be missed when you're gone? Because as we come on to the final ACEDB, I think Caleb was also a man of blessing. Because as we went into chapter 15, although Caleb got his dream hill, his dream home there, setting himself up for retirement, he wasn't done. Because even still in that, we hear that he's trying to get a good husband for his daughter. 
And in those days, a good husband seemed to be one who was a good fighter. So, Josh, you better get, get practicing in your judo. But also, when his daughter then comes to him and says, I want a field. So, Abby, if you need any hints of what to ask me for, a field is what you're needing. Okay? But she comes, and what he gives her is the springs, a field with springs. You needed water. That was where the real uh, fertile areas were going to be, was where the water was. And I think, what does my research say this morning? from Wikipedia, said, at least in modern times, there are ten springs and three wells in the city. Well, one of those, Caleb, gave away. Because even at that point, he was focusing on others and not just himself. Now, as we grow older, and we have the aches and pains, those aches and pains are very real, and I don't want to suggest they're not. But even when we have those and life becomes a struggle, we do have to have that atti- have choose our attitude. Is it going to be poor me? Or is it going to be, who can I bless? And I've been reading a book um, by Billy Graham about getting older over the last few weeks. I haven't finished it yet. I'm a slow reader. But one of the things he talked about is that actually... When, our, when we hit our limitations and when we hit our struggles, that actually our pains and our aches seem less when we're trying to still give our lives to others. When we focus on them, suddenly what we're facing is no less real, but it seems less of an issue. Maybe that's not always true, but that's something that he wanted to point out in his book as he faced our old age. It's a good book, and I recommend it, because we need to be prepared for old age. We're all getting older. We all know we're going to face it. Will we, will we be ready? I'll leave it there on Caleb. There's probably lots more I could say. But we do have a, a communion time to come. And I know this should have been perhaps most the, the foremost thought in my mind as I was preparing this uh, sermon. But it was only at some point recently that I suddenly thought, this reminds me of Jesus. And there are just these things there that as I go through this A, B, C, D, E, that as we come into our communion time, this just so reminds me of the Lord Jesus. Uh, where's, my, oh, where's my slide gone? Oh, there it is. Jesus was from the same tribe as Caleb. He was from Judah. And he's described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's awesome. A lion of the tribe of Judah. Could you say of Jesus that he was wholehearted? That he was all in? I think so very much. This is what it says in John chapter 10. That Jesus said of himself, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. He was willing to lay down his life for you and for me. That's quite an all-in amount of commitment. There's not much more. There's nothing more he could have done to show he was all in. That takes courage. Again, in Mark, it says... He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. I don't think I'd want to know what faced me in the future if I was facing that. But that's the courage he had. We do not serve a weak Jesus. This is a man who was all in. This is a man with courage. Forget the Olympics. Look at Jesus. Hebrews says, Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Is there a man so driven 
as our Savior, the Lord Jesus. He could say, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Are you one of those lost ones today? Come and be found. Come and be saved. Because there's blessings that Jesus is giving to us. Our inheritance in heaven. Redemption. We're told in Ephesians 1, we're chosen. We're loved. We have the riches of his grace lavished upon us. What more could God give us? Jesus has paid it all. We don't have to. We don't have to be a Caleb. We don't have to be a Marge. But we can be a follower of Jesus. I've gone on longer than I would have liked, but we do need to have our communion time because that is perhaps the most important part of what we're doing today. So if you do love the Lord Jesus, if you're seeking to be his follower, then you can remember him, as he said, in taking the bread and the wine, the juice that we have here today. Jesus could say, his body was broken for us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He gave his life on the cross, enduring the suffering and the shame. He laid down his life, but he took it up again. Hallelujah. Shall we pray and then we'll take the bread as it comes round? Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of Caleb. Someone who was a wholehearted follower to the end of his life. And that gives us a great example to follow this week. But even more so, thank you for the Lord Jesus who willingly paid the cost for us all. Who laid down his life out of choice, as a ransom for many, came to seek and to save the lost. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, and we remember him this morning. Amen. Hopefully some people are going to distribute. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Paul. So if you take the bread when it comes round. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for shedding your blood for us. You poured out your blood on the cross that we might be forgiven. Thank you that you are indeed the bread of life to us. You're all that we need. You're the only one that can satisfy the only one that can, can save us and restore us and fit us for heaven. And we thank you that you're willing to do that for us. Lord Jesus, we remember you. You shed your blood for us. And we're thankful. Amen. If you hold on to the cup and we'll...
drink together once we've all received. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. final song together. Should we stand and sing? You laid aside your majesty, gave up everything for me, suffered at the hands of those who had created. You took all my guilt and shame, then you died and rose again. Now today you reign in heaven and earth exalted. I really want to worship you, my Lord. You have won my heart and I am yours. Forever and ever I will love you. You are the only one who died for me, gave your life to set me free. So I lift my voice to you in adoration. Heavenly Father, I pray you might now bless us and help us as we go from here. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to know you more closely and help those who are struggling this week, we pray. Amen. Our service is now over. Do stay for tea, coffee, biscuits, etc. Chat if you want to. Come and talk to me if you want to as well. Thank you for coming.